All right, welcome and thank you for joining us for the third lecture of three for this semester's series of lectures on the history and legacy of Black entrepreneurship in the United States, hosted by Princeton, Princeton University's Keller Center. Um, uh, we started this series in the spring of 2021 and are thrilled to be continuing it. I'm excited to tell you about this series and to introduce you to our, to our amazing speaker, Dr. Leon Prieto. My name is Isam Beezer, and I'm a graduate student fellow hosted by the Keller Center and a PhD candidate at Rutgers Business School, where I study entrepreneurship from both the contemporary and historical perspectives. The center's mission is to arm our community with the intellectual foundation, innovation skills, and networks to propel positive and sustainable societal impact. As a center, we recognize the pervasive and systematic racial inequality in our country and how this can deeply this is deep, how this is deeply linked to so many of our country's profound challenges. We understand how important it is for our community to have this understanding of these systemic inequalities as we work on solving some of humanity's most pressing solutions, uh, challenges rather. Which brings me to, to this series of lectures. For all interested in, um, interested in innovation and entrepreneurship, much can be learned from the entrepreneurs who have succeeded under the most daunting of circumstances. For at the end of the day, isn't that what entrepreneurship is all about? Assembling limited resources for impact? Black innovators and entrepreneurs have overcome restrictive markets, segregation, Jim Crow laws, lack of access to capital, threats of violence and death, um, threat, um, theft of intellectual capital, and many other extreme challenges. Yet still, they thrived. These entrepreneurs have created innovations which have resulted in lasting societal and cultural changes far beyond the Black community. By exploring the history of Black entrepreneurship and innovation, we want to learn from the, from the creative strategies Black entrepreneurs employed to succeed. At the same time, we want to explore how the constraints on Black entrepreneurship and business development have limited overall economics, not only of Black communities, but our society as a whole. And how so many of these constraints, how so many of these constraints have become institutionalized and can be overcome in the future. This exciting series of talks brings together scholars and academics from numerous institutions from around the country um, to share their scholarship in a discussion-based forum. Uh, but, but, but before I start, um, before I introduce today's scholar, uh, please put in your Q&A, your questions in the Q&A. And if there's time at the end of the talk, Dr. Prieto will answer those. So I'm delighted to introduce you to Dr. Prieto. His talk is titled, Decolonizing the Business Curriculum, Insights from Africana History and Philosophy. So here's a bit of Dr. Prieto's bio. He's the director of the Center of Social Innovation and Sustainable Entrepreneurship, and also an associate professor of management at Clayton State University. He also serves as an associate research fellow at the University of Cambridge at the Judge Business School Center of Social Innovation. His research lies at the intersection of management history critical management studies, social issues in management ma and management education and can be found and his work can be found in the Journal of Business Ethics, the Academy of Management Learning and Education, Harvard Business Review, MIT Sloan Management Review and the Journal of Management History. He also co-authored the book, African American History, African American Management History, Insights on Gaining a Cooperative Advantage uh, with his co-author, Dr. Simone Phipps. So with now, without further ado, I pass the room to Dr. Prieto. Thank you very much, Isan, for that gracious introduction. I'd well, like to thank um, Cornelia, um, Isan, Gina, and the entire um, Keller Center team for this invitation. And I'm very excited to talk to you all today about decolonizing the curriculum. All right, so decolonizing the business curriculum insights from Africana history and philosophy. So a little about me before I proceed. Um, by the accent, you could probably tell I'm from the Caribbean. I'm originally from Trinidad and Tobago. And, and I grew up in a culture that embraced a number of African traditions, and we didn't even realize it. You know, so I participated in a susu growing up which is a type of a rotating savings um, that people in the Caribbean 
such as Trinidad, we call it Susu, Jamaicans call it partner, um, the Kenyans call it Chama, and it has different names in different parts of um, the African diaspora. So I always grew up with these philosophies of cooperation. And this, this is some of the things I'm going to talk about um, within this presentation, ways we can decolonize the business curriculum by bringing in certain African and Africana traditions of um, cooperation. You know, so it's very important, I believe, to reflect on some of these things. And then growing up in Trinidad, you know, um, I studied history at the advanced level in secondary school or high school. And I was always disappointed um, with the curriculum for the most part. So we spent a lot of time learning about how the white man freed the slaves, but we didn't spend enough time learning about how the enslaved Africans free themselves. And W.E.B. Du Bois in his classic Black Reconstruction did a good job illustrating that. But those things were missing in the curriculum in the Caribbean. And I would argue it's, it's still missing in the curriculum in the United States and other parts of the African diaspora. All right, so capitalism in its unbridled form, in my opinion, is contributing to the brokenness of our shared humanity. And we need to go further than just teaching capitalism, especially to the demographics that traditionally lack access to capital. You know, so we still hear, you know, a lot of um, complaints from people of color people of African descent stating that access to capital, you know, is an issue. It's a perennial issue, right? And there's a need to utilize critical pedagogy as influenced by Paulo Freire and his classic pedagogy of the oppressed. So we need to utilize critical pedagogy and encourage students to reimagine a more compassionate form of the capitalistic economic system. And we need a system that encourages business leaders and their firms to focus more on social sustainability, the importance of human rights, especially within global supply chains. And we need more business leaders and their firms to focus on community well being as much as they do profit, right? So we see a very myopic focus on profit, you know? So it's time to come up with a curriculum that de-emphasizes the importance of unbridled capitalism. And decolonizing the curriculum is a good approach to tackle this. And then we have some business schools, you know, claiming to be serious about addressing the racial inequities and systemic racism faced by people of African descent. And we see a number of these high profile initiatives addressing faculty diversity, financial barriers, recruitment, et cetera, right? But um, I would argue that some of these business schools and even some corporations engage in this disgusting practice known as performative allyship, you know? so. Um, so you will see these initiatives about faculty diversity, and then they will hire a number of black faculty. But when you count the amount of them who, are, who attain tenure, you know, the number is, is abysmal, right? So however, to go beyond performative allyship, business schools are called to address course content and to shape a more inclusive and more comprehensive curriculum. So I mentioned, you know, um, taking an advanced level history class in secondary school and being disappointed with the with a curriculum that in my opinion was not inclusive or comprehensive. It didn't reflect um, the ideas, the thoughts, the philosophies of the African people who were enslaved and how they free themselves. That was totally missing. So we need a curriculum that fully represents the commercial challenges 
Black entrepreneurs faced and the victories they won before, during, and after slavery and colonialism. So the time is right to decolonize the management curriculum, right? And I believe that restoring Black history and Africana philosophies in general into the business school curriculum is a key step forward towards embracing and enhancing the knowledge, the self-efficacy, and the motivation of our Black students, right? And this is needed because very little attention has been paid to the histories of management um, from Africa, as well as um, other parts of the global South, you know, namely um, India, Latin America, China. And when you read the, the management textbook, it's almost as if those parts of the world contributed nothing. You know, and it's almost insulting, you know, if you really think about it, right? So scholars such as Cummins, Bridgman, Hassad, and Rawlinson, they question the lack of diverse representation in a management canon that relies so heavily on theories dominated by Anglo-American and Eurocentric points of view. You know, so they wrote this book called um, The New History of Management, which was a bit controversial um, because, you know, there are a number of scholars who, who like the status quo. And they called for scholars to engage in research that looks at different histories of enterprise, different histories of management, because it, it can't just be coming from, you know, Europe and the United States. And usually when you read chapter two in a management textbook, in a management textbook, what you might see is um, a small mention about um, the Egyptians, they use management practices to build pyramids. And then that's it. You see nothing else about um, contributions of African people to building enterprises and things like that. It just stops with the pyramids, the end. So the time is right now, especially to decolonize the curriculum during this turbulent point of cultural change, right? So, you know, so in, in light of um, all the racial injustices, um, people of African descent and other people of color have, have faced um, throughout the history in this country, and that became very much amplified last year during the death of, um, or the murder of George Floyd. The time is right, right now. And I would like to pay my respects to, pay my respect to Dr. Charles W. Mills. He recently passed. He was a philosopher, professor, um, Jamaican American of African descent. And he wrote, a very influential book known as The Racial Contract, right? And that book taught us, that essay, it was really an essay, it taught us that the social contract from its very inception was inherently racialized and it posited that white supremacy fundamentally shaped how Western philosophical thinkers conceive humanity. So based on that, of course, there's a mostly Eurocentric canon. And the thoughts and ideas of racialized people were deemed unsuitable. And because of this, um, you know, the canon is what it is today, you know, um, very Eurocentric. And one that historically favored an economy structured around the racial exploitation of people of color. And another term for that is um, racial capitalism, right? So there was a scholar, he's pretty much forgotten now. He a, was a Trinidadian American economist with Marxist leanings by the name of Oliver Cox. So he wrote this seminal classic in 1948 known as Caste, Class, and Race. 
and he argued that um, you know the slave was a worker whose labor was exploited in production for profit in a capitalist market. And it is this fundamental fact which identifies the Negro problem in the United States with a problem of all workers, regardless of color. So he recognized um, the role of racial capitalism as it played in building you know, um, a lot of so-called first world nations. So building on this, Cedric Robinson, in his classic Black Marxism, he built on Oliver Cox's work. He argued that racial capitalism depended on slavery, imperialism, genocide, and violence. And when we examine some of the contemporary atrocities within global supply chains today, we must ask ourselves, have things really changed, right? And we must also ask ourselves whether or not our students are challenged enough within their current curriculum to really reflect on an economic system that has long derived social and economic value from the racial identity of others, right? And in my first couple of years teaching, um, I used to question myself, am I really challenging my students enough? Uh, am I challenging them to really critique unbridled capitalism? And sadly, um, I wasn't really challenging them the way I should have. And then I decided, you know what? I'm gonna try to give my students an education that I didn't really receive, right? So this system of racial capitalism, it resulted in enslaved Africans experiencing social debt, as argued by Dr. Orlando Patterson, a Jamaican American sociologist at Harvard, who wrote his classic book, Slavery and Social Debt. And my socially dead ancestors had no rights and their humanity was not respected. And unfortunately, you know, that culture persists and is reflected in the curriculum. You know, so, so socially dead people, they have no humanity, they have no history, they have no philosophies. So of course, the ideas and philosophies and histories of my ancestors didn't really make it into a number of um, business textbooks, management textbooks, or the canon in general. And I must give credit to Ngogi Wathiongo's classic Decolonizing the Mind. And this was a powerful influence um, to me and, and a number of other scholars who are working to decolonize the curriculum, be it in management, be it in sociology, be it in um, the sciences. You know, so um, that work was a powerful influence because it reminds us that Africana histories and philosophies are worthy, are worthy and can help sustain Black communities. So Thiongo, he was persecuted in Kenya for his ideas as it relates to decolonization. You know, so he made a radical choice of writing all of his books in his native Kikuyu language. And it's sad that we have to use the term radical to describe his approach um, to his scholarship. It shouldn't be radical for anyone to write a book or their works in their native tongue, in their native tongue, you know, so that's what he did. And he has motivated a number of um, scholars who are trying to decolonize to try to really embrace Africana histories and philosophies. So we need to re-engage with Ubuntu, Umuganda, Ujama, and other traditions of cooperation that can facilitate a more communitarian approach to capitalism. We need one that nourishes our shared humanity. You know, so some of these African, Africana traditions can help humanize capitalism as an economic system. Because 
this system, as you know, it has engendered a lot of social ills from racial injustices to what we're seeing with the climate right now, you know? So things have to change. So Ubuntu, which is a South African philosophy, this embodies a spirit of cooperation within African societies and can be translated to mean, I am because we are. And according to Bangura, um, there are three main tenets of Ubuntu, namely spirituality, dialogue, and consensus building. So in many West African societies, and um, West and South African societies, um, there are these philosophies of cooperation. They may have different names, but a number of them share um, the same sentiment pretty much. You know, it's all about cooperation, communitarianism versus rugged individualism, right? So building from that foundation, uh, myself and Dr. Simone Phipps, you know, we wrote this book called African-American Management History, Insights on Gaining a Cooperative Advantage, where we, where we reflected on some of these Africana traditions of cooperation and how it can be utilized today to help um, entrepreneurs gain a cooperative advantage. And we define it as the benefits that an organization possesses and accrues due to its people-centered approach to engendering a spirit of care and community, dialogue, and consensus building for the benefit of employees, customers, and community. And we found that you know there were a number of Black business pioneers um, in the past that utilized this cooperative advantage to gain an edge and to also help their communities. So we got to decolonize the mind before we decolonize the curriculum. And we must reflect on Sankofa, which is an Akan word from Ghana which means go back and get it. And this is precisely what myself and um, Dr. Simone Phipps tried to do as it relates to our scholarship. We need to go back and get it, go back to the histories and philosophies from Mother Africa and try to learn and reflect on it and see how it could benefit us today. So there's a lot we can learn from Black business pioneers during the golden age of Black business. And um, they experience a number of, um, they experience goodwill, support, financial performance based on their pursuit of a cooperative advantage, right? And, um, and this approach survived the, the Middle Passage into the Americas. So I mentioned earlier that in Trinidad and Tobago, where I'm from, a number of African traditions survive, like Susu, I mentioned, and there was another one called Gayap, which is the philosophy of cooperation where you lend a hand. That's what it means, lend a hand. So if a neighbor is trying to um, build a home, um, well, renovate their home, in fact, um, the people of the community will come together and lend a hand, you know, for no money. You know, I grew up with that philosophy. I didn't think it was African. I just thought it was a Trinidadian thing. But only when I got older, I realized this was an African tradition, right? So a number of these traditions found its way into the Caribbean. It found its way into the United States. And we saw it uh, manifested in mutual aid societies, in the Black church. And it found its way into Black enterprises because a number of Black businesses got their start in African-American mutual aid societies and the Black church. So early Black businesses embody the spirit of cooperation and some of the business pioneers embraced and operationalized African traditions and contributed in ways that sustain their firms and their business ecosystems. So we argue that they practice the more communitarian and compassionate version of capitalism. And by communitarianism, um, African communitarianism, what I mean by that is that um, African societies tend to focus more on the group 
So it represents a view that the attainment of human needs and interests is best served in union with others. So the first president of Senegal um, was a scholar, Leopold Sengo. He argued that West Africans are built on the idea of community and a deeply humanist mindset. And then the philosopher Masolo, he argued that European collectivism, on the other hand, is an assembly of individuals, while African societies put more emphasis on the group than on the individual and more on solidarity than on the needs of the individual and more on the communion of persons than on their autonomy. So there's a, a bit of a difference between European communitarianism versus African communitarianism. And this is pretty much um, the foundation of African humanism. And as a student, not just in secondary school, but also in um, college, grad school, I was struck by the glaring omissions of the intellectual history of African and Black thinkers, philosophers, and scholarship. And, um, and frankly, you know, it was you know, it was a bit disturbing, a bit annoying to see these omissions, you know. So as, later as a management scholar, you know, I, um, I decided, you know what, I need to do something about it, you know. So myself and Dr. Simone Phipps, um, we went to work. We went to, to address some of the gaps um, that we saw, right? So the philosophies and practices of black business pioneers, in our opinion, they are relevant. And we need to utilize critical pedagogy to facilitate student empowerment via an inclusive learning experience, which encourages them to foster critical thinking that will promote not just entrepreneurial success, but also social sustainability and possibly even social transformation. And the way we view decolonizing the curriculum, um, it might be a bit different from other folks, but we see it as one that addresses pre-colonial Africa, slavery, capitalism, and modern, slave, um, modern management, the golden age of black business, and finally, alternative models of enterprise, ones that are utilized by people of African descent. So as it relates to pre-colonial Africa um, and pre-colonial um, African entrepreneurship, it has been neglected and dismissed, you know? So Africa as a continent in general, you know, has been dismissed as one that is devoid of histories and traditions of enterprise that are worthy of coverage. And it's, very important for our students to be made aware of the rich history that really does exist. You know, so I would like to encourage folks, you know, to read the work of Carl Siri, you know, who wrote a, um, an article in the Journal of Management History that explores Igbo management history um, philosophy. So the Igbo people, you know, you know they are um, an ethnic group with, within Nigeria. And the Igbos have their own um, philosophies of enterprise that's quite fascinating. And then we have um, Chambi Chachaji. He was actually a postdoctoral scholar at Princeton for a number of years. And he wrote this really good dissertation when he was a doctoral student at Harvard that really explores um, the history of commerce in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, you know? And he pretty much showed that, you know, there was a rich history of enterprise within um, Tanzania, right? And a lot of people, you know, will be surprised that these things exist, but I'm not surprised. You know, I come from an enterprising people. And an example of an enterprising um, African was Jaja Fopobo. You know, he built a large business empire in Nigeria. And, um, and he received praise for his organizational skills. 
And then after the Berlin, the 1884 Berlin Conference um, partitioned Africa into various European nations, the British eventually arrested and exiled Georgia to the Caribbean. And this pattern of disrupting Black enterprise was a common one. And as evidenced in Dr. Walter Rodney's, um, the Guyanese scholar, um, he wrote this, this um, seminal classic known as How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. You know, so by, introdu by introducing students to past and current African business traditions and figures, our courses can explore the complexity of Black enterprise, as well as the disruptive forces of colonial power in, in the agency and growth of African entrepreneurship. So we do not reflect on pre-colonial African entrepreneurship at all. You know, it's, it's, it's non-existent but we need to. Then we also have to grapple with slavery, you know, capitalism and modern management, right? And, um, and a lot of scholars, they tend to underplay the role of slavery in fueling the industrial revolution. You know, so they, they act as if, you know, European exceptionalism and American exceptionalism helped build um, Europe and the United States and then they always fail to um, recognize the importance of slavery in helping building those nations, you know? So in my view, it is certain that capitalism and slavery are linked and scholars have, and other scholars have argued that slavery has been wrongfully excised from histories of management and economic growth. So we saw compelling arguments from Bill Cook in an article he wrote in 2003 and Caitlin Rosenthal, in a recent um, book she wrote that's called Accounting for Slavery, which was written in 2018. And then I'm also proud of the work of my countryman, um, Dr. Eric Williams, the first prime minister of um, Trinidad and Tobago, when he went to Oxford University for his PhD in history. Um, he did a lot of research, on, um, which resulted in his classic um, book, which was written in, I want to say 1944, Capitalism and Slavery. And he argued that slavery played a central role in the economic development of Europe, and that was abolished only when it was no longer financially feasible, and not primarily for humanitarian reasons. You know, so when I studied um, West Indian history in high school, you know, they, they spent a lot of time talking about Wilberforce and Taylor and all these um, abolitionists and the humanitarian reasons for ending slavery. But um, thankfully, um, I was introduced to Eric Williams' work, Capitalism and Slavery, um, to pretty much demonstrate that slavery was ended, um, as Williams argued, because it was no longer financially feasible. But this is the big debate that has been raging since 1944. But I'm on the side of Williams, you know, so um, I embrace that bias. So it's time for business schools to wrestle with the role of chattel slavery and the subjugation of Africans in fueling US and European economic advancement, as well as the ties between capitalism and slavery. So racial capitalism is still a reality today, right? And I believe that addressing these topics, it better prepares our students to really grapple with a complex historical relationship between capitalism, race, and slavery. And so this is a conversation that needs to continue, you know? So race matters, capitalism matters, slavery matters in this conversation. To paraphrase um, Cornel West. So the golden age of black business, um, this was a term um, defined by Dr. Juliet E.K. Walker and she wrote, a classic known as the history of black business in America. And that work provides a rich history of uh, black enterprise. So the golden age of black business was a period she defined um, as a age where there was a lot of um, booming black businesses during 1900 to 1930. And an and enterprising individual who um, myself and Dr. Simone Phipps um, studied was C.C. Spaulding, Charles Clinton Spaulding. 
right? And during his time managing the North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Company um, in Durham's Black Wall Street, um, he helped his company achieve the cooperative advantage, which stemmed from African traditions of cooperation. So we argue that. And um, so he played a critical role in the history of management. He is not in many people's textbooks, but thankfully a number of textbooks are including um, the work done by Simon Phipps and myself, and they including um, the work of um, Charles Clinton Spaulding, and they're recognizing him in the history of management now in some textbooks. So he was inducted into the Thinkers 50 Hall of Fame. He, uh, he was the first African-American inducted to this Hall of Fame. And pioneers like Spaulding, and others like Magdalena Walker and Annie Turnbull Malone, they should be acknowledged along with the lessons they impart about cooperation, even in the face of hostility and racism. So this is just some um, uh, newspaper article from 1937, the Saturday Evening Post entitled, they call him Cooperation. You know, so he was known as Mr. Cooperation. And this all stems from the continent of Africa, you know, and um, a lot of these traditions survived within African American communities, right? So when Spaulding managed um, the North Carolina Mutual, which at the time was the largest African American um, business, he embodied this whole philosophy of cooperation, right? And when Du Bois visited Durham's Black Wall Street in 1912, he praised the North Carolina Mutual for his emphasis on cooperation over capitalism. He was very much impressed with his whole philosophy of cooperation he was seeing in, in Durham. So Du Bois, you know, he wrote this um, book called Economic Cooperation Among Negroes. And he pretty much advocated for African-Americans to, really to really embody Black economic cooperation. So Du Bois was all about um, cooperative um, economics and Black economic cooperation in general. And Du Bois saw the connection to Africa in his work. But back to Spaulding. So Spaulding, you know, he contributed to management and entrepreneurship principles that was absent from the management canon. So you would see Frederick Taylor, you would see Chester Barnard, um, Henry Fayol, but you will not see um, people like Charles Clinton Spaulding. You're seeing them now, but we were not seeing them previously in the management canon. And Spaulding had a number of thought leadership, a number of articles that demonstrated his thought leadership, such as his eight fundamental necessities of management and his four cardinal points of entrepreneurship. And this is just an example of um, some of his thought leadership. So first and foremost, he talked about the importance of cooperation and teamwork as being an essential part of um, business culture, team-based culture. So he wrote this article in 1927 in the Pittsburgh Courier, which was a very prominent African-American newspaper. He also talked about the importance of adequate manpower and he emphasized HBCU's role in integrating theory and practice um, to better prepare students. So he had some really compelling thought leadership. Another one is his four cardinal points of entrepreneurship, where he talked about the importance of having character, good character to be an entrepreneur, the importance of social service in business, which predates um, a number of scholarship that talked about social entrepreneurship. So Spaulding was talking about so social service in business in 1937 when he wrote the four cardinal points of entrepreneurship in the Southern Workman magazine, right? So he saw the need for his business to be a social enterprise, positively making an impact in his community as well as making a profit. So he was leap years ahead of a number of um, people who we know, currently acknowledge as um, the thought leaders of management. And then another thing that business schools need to do as well to help decolonize the curriculum is by focusing on some of the alternative models of enterprise. And I hate to use the term alternative 
but um, but I'll have to use it because it's not the normative, you know. So business schools rarely teach about cooperative business models, and yet these forms of ent enterprise um, that have been jointly owned and ran by its own members have been and continue to be very useful for African Americans, you know. So. Um, so we see examples today in Jackson, Mississippi, with Corporation Jackson, which is like a cooperative network made up of mostly African Americans um, ideating and conceptualizing and launching these cooperatives that are really making a big effort as it relates to community and sustainable development within Jackson, Mississippi. And hopefully it becomes a movement. And, um, and they've been making a lot of progress and they've been receiving a lot of um, positive press. And then the work of scholars such as Jessica Gordon Nemhard, who wrote a classic known as Collective Courage, which looks at the history of um, African-American cooperatives. This should be addressed in the business schools. And also the work of Caroline Shanaz Hussein, who wrote a book on the Black social economy in the Americas. So she's a Canadian scholar of um, Caribbean descent who writes a lot about Roscas, which are these um, rotating savings associations, um, sip, um, such as Susus, which I mentioned earlier on, and Chama, and these other um, rotating saving um, associations that a lot of people of African descent utilize in the past and they currently utilize it today. You know, so when business schools teach the histories of these approaches and explore their economic impact, this more inclusive curriculum prepares students to respond to challenges they may encounter. So our students could learn about these traditions of black economic cooperation and access capital if they're denied from the bank, which usually happens to a lot of um, African Americans, you know. So Du Bois was a proponent of co-ops within the Black community. And, um, and in a recent article written by myself, Simone Phipps, Lilia Guini, and Neil Stott, we showed how he inspired William Matney of Bluefield State College. And Bluefield State um, is an HBCU. Um, located in West Virginia. And Du Bois influenced Professor, Mat Professor Matney's um, approach to teaching business, right? And um, so Matney, he taught his students the cooperative business model, um, and it received a lot of attention in the 1920s, right? And um, this is just a photo of Du Bois to the left and Professor Matney. And Matney was one of the first black um, graduates of Harvard Business School. And he played a major role in providing a very thorough education to his students. Uh, but he was influenced by Du Bois. And Du Bois was a big advocate of um, cooperative economics. And he wrote about it extensively, right? And both Du Bois, Matney, and some others, they founded a Negro Cooperative Guild, which was an organization charged with assisting African Americans in the formation of cooperatives. And, and um, Matney, Professor Matney, when he left Harvard Business School, um, you know, he started to teach at Bluefield State. He started a student cooperative store alongside a number of students, and it was a a big success and they generated revenues. They were able to award scholarships to other students. And, um, you know, so it was very successful, but unfortunately the state of West Virginia decided to close down um, the cooperative. And this should not be seen as an isolated incident, you know, because, you know, um, of racism. It was a powerful demonstration that the experiment challenged dominant policy views. So in that article we wrote that's entitled Teaching Cooperative Business, um, the Bluefield Experiment and the Future of Black Business Schools, uh, we make the argument that that co-op was pretty much closed based on a previous argument made by Jessica Gordon Nemhard that 
um, black co-ops co were usually obstructed by white supremacy, right? But teaching cooperative business, especially from an African or African-American perspective, um, can be a powerful tool to educate our students because a number of the black co-ops in the past, um, it focused a lot of, on solidarity, which is a very important concept within African humanism. And it focused you know, a lot on social justice in general. So there are cooperatives today that are devoid of social justice and solidarity, but there is a push within the cooperative movement to bring back some of those ideals into the cooperative movement. And, and here are some of the pioneers our students need to learn about. They need to learn about um, some of the pioneers in the cooperative movement. And these people are not in the textbooks. You know, we got Ella Baker. You know, she was a civil rights activist. She was very much a pioneer in the cooperative, the Black cooperative movement with the Young Negroes Cooperative League. Then there's Fannie Lou Hamer with the Freedom Farm Cooperative. You know, she's another legend within the African-American community. And another person uh, many folks never heard about, another legend in the cooperative movement was Father Albert, Albert McKnight with the Southern Cooperative Development Fund. You know, so they all made great strides fostering economic development via cooperatives, right? And many of them faced tremendous hurdles due to white opposition. Many of them were called un-American or communist. Um, Father Albert McKnight, you know, he faced a number of um, lawsuits and, and, and um, scathing newspaper articles trying to make him seem as if he was engaged in criminal activity by helping poor folks, mostly African-American in Louisiana, start cooperatives, you know, but he's a legend that um, they're all legends and our students should know about them. So when business schools teach the histories of these alternative approaches to enterprise and they fully explore the economic impact, this will create a more comprehensive curriculum, one that is more inclusive, and it could better prepare our students to respond to the challenges that they may encounter in the real world. Many of them wouldn't get capital. So a logical choice, in my opinion, is to form cooperatives and pool their resources informally or formally. So in conclusion, um, I will quote Dr. Henry Louis Gates, you know, to, so to reform core curriculums, to account for the comparable eloquence of the African, the Asian, the Middle Eastern traditions, is to prepare our students for their roles as citizens of a world culture, educated through a truly human notion of the humanities. So we need to learn from, from that saying, from that um, quote, and expand the canon in management as Dr. Gates did for um, literature. You know, he made Zora Neale Hurston and, um, and Langston Hughes and others. Um, he put them on the mainstream. He helped put them on the mainstream. So myself and Dr. Phipps and others, we are trying to, you know, put people like Charles Clinton Spaulding, Annie Turnbull Malone, Magdalena Walker, Ella Baker, um, Father Albert McKnight and Fanny Lou Hamer. They should be in the canon as well, you know, and uh, we need a curriculum that challenges our students to critically examine capitalism and the persistent inequalities within the status quo, right? So we need to operationalize racial justice in the form of a more inclusive curriculum. And this is just um, a diagram that illustrates how to do it, you know? So our students need to learn about pre-colonial Africa, slavery, capitalism, and modern slavery. They need to be challenged with knowledge about um, alternative models of enterprise and the golden age of black business. And this will increase entrepreneurial knowledge and motivation. And it, it will eventually lead to entrepreneurial success, community support, and hopefully social sustainability. So we need to really challenge business schools to do more. And thankfully, I'm, I'm practicing what I'm preaching. I am in the process of creating classes 
that reflect some of the things I just discussed um, today. But anyway, let me end it here. I would love to get some of your questions. And this is my book um, alongside Dr. Simone Phipps, African American Management History. And that's my social media handle, Leon C. Prieto, if you want to connect with me. Thank you so much, Dr. Prieto. That was wonderful. Um, I learned a lot. It was insightful, important, and definitely timely. So we have a few questions. Uh, the first one is, um, is decolonizing, decolonizing the curriculum different at the undergraduate and MBA levels? If so, how? Um, of course, there are many levels um, to, to the, th that you noted in the talk, but perhaps there are two, that these two very common business and management school student groups are, are most salient for this discussion. Well, I guess um, it depends on the term of depth you cover um, within an undergraduate course or graduate level course. Um, but I believe both students um, groups, be it undergraduate students and graduate students, they both deserve a robust and inclusive curriculum that really covers some of these um, topics that I cover today as it relates to Africana um, histories and philosophies of management, of enterprise in general, you know? So, um, so I'm in the process of creating a class that um, focuses on Black entrepreneurship and management history for my undergraduate students. Um, there's a lot to cover, you know? So, I'm kind of concerned about the depth of the course I'll be teaching because I do want to cover a wide breadth of different things. So it may not have the depth that I would like, you know, but at the graduate level, if I ever do create a course um, at the graduate level, it might go a little bit deeper, right? But I'd, um, I don't want to scare off my undergraduate students with, <laughs> with a depth, but I do want to introduce them to a number of these philosophies and concepts and figures, you know. So, so thanks for the question. Um, and I guess a follow-up to that is, it seems like this type of um, initiative to, to change the curriculum, some people argue that it could be under social, so it would be more an elective. It, do you feel like that's a natural way to get it in, or should you try to put it into a uh, an entrepreneurship intro to entrepreneurship course 101 or intro to strategy course and have that process be the way that uh, people get exposed to this even if it's not in depth at least there's some type of exposure to it that's a very good question and um and i will cite my example or, or my progress in this whole matter of um, creating a course like this um i'm introducing it as an elective and um but I want to see, I want to really show a proof of concept with this course, and I'm anticipating a large number of students, not just from the business school, but from other schools as well, other colleges within my university. And based on that proof of concept, I may petition to get it as part of the um, required courses a required course within the entrepreneurship curriculum. But for now, um, it, it's been offered, it will be offered as an elective. And that's a strategic way to approach it, you know, because some folks are going to say, you know, um, is this really, do our students really want to learn this? Is this really something that um, um, business schools should be teaching? You know, you'll always face opposition or questions and all these things. And some folks might want to water down a course on Black entrepreneurship or management history and say, let's just call it minority entrepreneurship history or something, you know, so you will face a number of different challenges, but a good approach is to try to squeeze it in as an elective and then, you know, a proof of concept to show that there's a, a strong demand for a course like that. Great. Thank you. Yeah, that makes sense. I could totally imagine a, a module um, exposing or a guest speaker as a, as a way of introducing it. So I, I love it. And um, seeing that you're you're speaking at the Keller Center at Princeton University. Uh, they're not, not all universities or colleges have a business school or management school or a college of such. Are, do you see any differences um, in how this could be approached um, when you try to introduce it to the curriculum? Uh, so maybe, I guess it's more of an advice question. Are there one or two points of advice 
for implementing it at schools that don't have a business school. If, if there's any difference at all, it might, might just be a, a university academic thing as opposed to a, a business school management school thing. I think there's, um, I think it's actually a plus, you know, um, if the university doesn't have a business school, because, you know, some folks in business schools are so focused on the AACSB accreditation and they're very nitpicky about the classes that they offer, you know, so they'll actually be more flexibility in a university that doesn't have a business school to really experiment and come up with a, a really interesting um, course that um, decolonizes the curriculum. Like, to be honest, if I was working at a school like Princeton or, or some other university that doesn't have a business school, I think I might actually be much more creative in how I structure the course and, um, and how I deliver it as well. So I think um, there's tremendous opportunities to do so outside of a business school. It might actually be a much more interesting course in my opinion. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so um, we have two quick questions. Um, I know we, all, we have less than three minutes left. The, the first one is, um, is there any evidence of the scalability of African management enterprise? Are the evidence? Well, the evidence is based on, um, you know, you could look at W. E. B. Du Bois's um, work, Economic Cooperation Among Negro Americans, and, um, which was the first work that really looked at um, Black economic cooperation at a large scale. And then the research conducted by Jessica Gordon Nemhard um, in her book, Collective Courage, which showcased a history of African American cooperatives. It showed a very rich history of black enterprise um, you know within um, the cooperative um, space and then there were a number of african-american businesses that were not cooperatives but they still embody this whole philosophy of cooperation which stemmed all the way from africa you know so there was a, um, a book written by way um, which looked at um, Black Wall Street in Durham, North Carolina. The name escapes me right escapes me right now, but there are a number of works that that show the the rich contributions of African Americans as it relates to business enterprise in the United States. But of course, no one knows these works because it's not in the curriculums, you know. So these works exist. There are a number of scholars doing phenomenal works, you know. So as I mentioned previously, you know, Jessica Gordon Nemhard, we got Juliet Walker. And, um, and a number of other folks who are doing pioneering work, but people, a lot of people still don't see the value of Black enterprise, Africana traditions, and all these things. So they are not in the textbooks, they are not in the curriculum, so they don't exist. Great, thank you. And we have a, a less, less than a minute, but I have a quick question about um, liberal white philanthropy. It can be seen as an attempt to hinder independent Black control activity. Um, do you feel that this is this is so, or do you think it's um, more of a positive impact than a, than a hindrance for Black entrepreneurship? Well, I guess it depends on the intent, you know, of the philanthropy. And, um, and, and nothing is wrong with, um, you know, you know, white folks um, with access to capital, um, investing in in black businesses because it's not a recent phenomenon, you know. So in Durham's Black Wall Street, we had the Duke family, um, um, the namesake of Duke University, who um, loaned money to Charles Clinton Spaulding and John Merrick to start the North Carolina Mutual, and then um, Merrick and um, and Spalding, they paid back um, the Duke family, usually at a 6% interest, you know, so it wasn't like philanthropy in a sense of, you know, they just, you know, give money to the Black folks and look at them go, you know, we're so proud of them. It wasn't anything like that. It was a business transaction. They saw a need to help their neighbor. And they also made a profit as well, you know, so so um so so pretty much um, white liberals um I encourage them to support black enterprise but make sure the intent 
is um, is authentic and it should be seen as a cooperative enterprise between both parties where both can exchange knowledge, exchange ideas, and um, it could be a win-win situation, you know? So black and white cooperation is needed. It was needed back then and it's needed now, you know? But we just need to make sure that um, the intent is authentic. Absolutely, thank you so much. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Prieto. This and everyone in attendance. Today's event ends the lectures of this semester series. So thank you all for, for coming and make sure you watch the replays later. On November 30th from 12.30 p.m. to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard, we will have a concluding round table with all three scholars from this semester. Uh, please register and participate in this discussion. It will be a fun, lively conversation. I, I assure you that and of course, informative. Plus you get a chance to ask um, more your questions directly and also engage with the scholars. So goodbye and take care, everyone. Thank you again, Dr. Prieto. Thank you. Learn more about the history and legacy of Black entrepreneurship in the United States by visiting kellercenter.princeton.edu slash Black entrepreneurship. Join us for future Keller Center events, which you can find at kellercenter.princeton.edu slash events.